My name is Jeremy Clark, and this is my persuasive speech, and this is my audience. In 1997, the wrestling community was shaken by three deaths in a short period of time of six weeks. How many of you have ever seen a gymnastics meet, a swimming meet, or a wrestling match on TV or even seen them in real life? Now, how many of you have thought about the pressures placed on athletes by coaches and parents to look and perform the way that they do? Today, I hope to shed some light on the ever-growing problem and convince you as coaches to recognize and discourage the problem of eating disorders within your athletes. First, let's take a look at the problem of eating disorders and how it is growing in amateur athletes. The NCAA performed a study of, of a group of college athletes and the numbers were astonishing. The results of this study showed that 93% of the athletes surveyed had had an eating disorder within the last two years. Within this group, 82% of the athletes had lost between 5 and 10 pounds a week. Whether this was the five, same 5 or 10 pounds each week was undetermined. The, this high number of athletes with eating disorder has led to a few of, few deaths. In 1997, there were three deaths, all within six weeks, all related to eating disorders within the wrestling community. These three deaths, even though they were all in different parts of the country, were caused by these three athletes trying to achieve the same goal, and that was making weight. Eating disorders increase stress on the body and can do more harm than good. Even though an athlete thinks that they are doing themselves a great favor by competing or by competing at a lower weight or weight class, they are really just causing undue stress onto their body. Eating disorders can lead to poor performance because they lack the nutrients and the vitamins that they need to perform at such a high level. In 1996, 75% of the polled athletes participated in frequent fasting. Estimates show that 25% to 67% of wrestlers participate in food restriction, fasting, or use various dehydration methods. Now that we have briefly looked at the problem within student athletes, let's take a little bit closer look at eating disorders themselves. Bulimia is one of the most common eating disorders and it can be recognized in one of, a, one of many ways. Cuts to the mouth and the back of the throat can be caused by self-induced vomiting. You may also notice that an athlete has frequent sore throats because the inflammation of the esophagus due to stomach acid from frequent vomiting. Many times acid will erode the enamel on your teeth and cause tooth decay or even yellowing of teeth. Bulimia can lead in excess to cardiac arrest. Bulimia also can cause dehydration from frequent vomiting and can cause kidney or renal failure. Anorexia is another common eating disorder among amateur athletes, and this can be recognized in a few ways as well. Anorexia does not allow the body to gain the nutrition that it needs from day-to-day -day eating. In females, the body can skip their menstrual cycle and cause a chemical imbalance. The body sleep cycle is, de is many times thrown out of whack and can cause the athlete to either sleep more or less than normal, and more often than not, they are groggy all the time. Signs of eating disorders can help coaches and parents to recognize and correct the problem. You may notice a sudden decrease in food intake. You may also notice that an athlete is extremely conscious about what they eat in front of people and they may stop eating in front of people altogether. You will often see a bulimic athlete making trips to the bathroom after eating a meal and you may also hear running water to help disguise the sound of vomiting. When athletes return from the bathroom, they may be chewing on a mint or they may be chewing on a stick of gum to help hide their bad breath. Self-esteem is often lower than normal and they may be moodier than normal too. Now that we've explored the types of disorders, let's take a look at what has been done and what can be done by parents and coaches. The NCAA took immediate steps after the three deaths to help remedy the problem. The use of sauna and rubberized non-breathable suits were no longer permitted. A 7 pound weight allowance had been added to each class and increased from the previous 1 pound allowance, meaning if an athlete was competing at 118 pounds they could weigh up to 125 pounds and still compete in that class. The weigh in time was moved from 24 hours before to 2 hours before a competition. This way an athlete has less time to recover if they did not cut weight properly. Coaches can take many proactive steps and here are a few that you can take. 
Coaches need to educate themselves on the dangers of eating disorders and how to recognize the warning signs of them. You can learn which training training techniques are healthy and unhealthy so that you can recognize and discourage an athlete from training unhealthily. Encourage counseling when needed if the problem is beyond your scope of help. I have shown the, the deaths in the late 90s caused by eating disorders. I have also brought to light the dangers of eating disorders themselves. A quote by an NCAA re representative embodies the whole thought behind why coaches and parents need to take on the responsibility themselves. We can make every rule in the book, but we can't legislate ethics. That's where the wrestlers and the coaches need to take the oneness on themselves and to follow the rules.